So a couple years ago, I was uh, over at the Figaro's down in Winston back when it was still open, and I was looking out over Highway 42, and all of a sudden, this guy starts running across the road, right in the middle of traffic. He wasn't in a crosswalk. He's just running across the road, and cars are honking, and they're swerving, and they're like, what on earth is he doing? And then I realized it. There was a deputy in hot pursuit on foot right behind him. And here's the beauty of it for the deputy. The guy in front is stopping traffic for him. The deputy has a cleaner shot at this. And finally, he crosses the road. The deputy catches up with him. And there's a little bit of a kerfuffle, if you will, where the gentleman, if let's call him that, and the deputy were trying to decide whose will was going to win out here. Now, what, what needed to happen is the gentleman, quotes, the gentleman needed to get down on his knees, needed to lay down, and needed to have his hands behind his back. But he wasn't willing to do that. His heart wasn't really there. So finally the deputy used a little foot here, a little hip here, flipped him down. And I have to say, it was awesome. It was so cool. <laughs> Flips him down, gets him on his hands and knees, gets him his hands behind his back and he's laying there. And I, I was looking at it and my realization was submission happened. You know, I don't know if you, you catch this, but we're in the middle of a sermon series where we're looking at worship. That worship and submission are really often synonymous the, the, the two go hand in hand. And in fact, positions of worship are actually echo positions of submission. And, and I'll show you, one of the positions of submission is simply to get on your, on your knees, to say, I'm beneath you. I'm down here and you're up there. Another one, a more extreme one, is actually to lay prostrate, where you lay your, your face to the ground. In fact, you'll see this throughout the Bible, where people will, in expressions of worship, their face will hit the ground to say, I am beneath you. And I was thinking to myself, for that guy, that gentleman, as we called him, the position that he took might have been proper, but I don't think his heart was really in it. His body was saying it, but his heart wasn't really there. Today, we're going to look at what it means to have worship at a deeper level. Last week, we looked at um, an aspect of worship, where, like the idea of worship clarity. And this week, we're going to look at what does it mean to have worship depth? What does it mean to actually have my heart fully invested and involved. And we're going to do this week a little different than normal. Typically, we will take one text and we will look specifically at it and say, what is it that the Bible says in this specific story or this specific section of the Bible about the topic? What we want to do today is we actually want to climb up to about 10,000 feet and say, what happened in the life of a, of a guy? We're going to look at a guy named King David. Now, when we start, he's not going to be a king. He's just going to be a 14-year-old, 13-year-old boy. But I want to look at three specific stories in his life, and I want us to look for this. How do we see worship happening in his life? And I'm going to warn you, uh, if you want a deeper worship time, it's probably not going to happen in easy times. In fact, what I see most often is that worship depth comes when God's deepening us, when submission isn't so readily given but call to from a deeper place that God is calling us to. So as we're looking at this, the so first thing I wanted to tell you about is to tell you probably the most famous story of David's life. And I want you to see the worship in it. It's, this is just a little background for you. But I want you to see worship in the midst of a conflict. You see, David was a 13, 14-year-old boy, and his job was to bring some supplies to the army who was fighting against the Philistines. And the Philistines had one big giant. And whether you know about Jesus, whether you know about the Bible, whether or not you've ever been to church, you know about this dude. His name is Goliath, and he's nine foot tall, and he is taunting the armies of God. And David comes up with the supplies and says, What's going on here? Someone going to step up to this? And David, in that awesome audacious way he says I'll go and he heads out and he picks up five smooth stones and he takes a sling and he says all right let's do this but on his way out you see you have Goliath nine foot tall and finally this is over like 40 days where he has been taunting the armies of Israel finally someone comes out and it's a 13 year old 14 year old adolescent is coming at him and he starts trash talking I mean this is like NBA level trash talking too he says to him Am I a dog that you send out a little boy to fight me? And David's response is where I want you to see this. He is about to face a nine-foot giant who has a spear the size of something big. I can't think of anything big right now, but it's huge, all right? He's got a huge spear, and he's gonna, this is going to impale him. David's life is on the line, and I want you to see his response because it's absolutely amazing. This is in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
This is what he says to him. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Yet you think this is about how big your stuff is? This, you think this is about how big you are or what weapons you have? It's, that ain't it. That's not it. Look what he goes on to say in the next verse. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. This very day I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And then look at this. He's talking to a nine-foot giant, and he says this, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And I don't know if you catch that right away, but you got to lean into this. David is facing something he cannot conquer, and he knows it. Do you realize what a humble phrase this is? Up here is just, it's just flat out awesome. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. Your entire army is going to be feasted on by birds and wild beasts. But then down here he says, yeah, you're going to lose. And out of that loss, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. You know why? Because I'm not supposed to beat you. I got nothing. I got five smooth stones and a sling. You yeah, you got it all, but you're missing the one thing that I have that you don't. I worship God Almighty. And he goes on in verse 47. And all those gathered here will know. Notice this. There's, there's this part of the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the power of God, that he's saying more people will know about who God is because of what's about to happen. The whole world will know, and everyone here will know, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and I will give all of you into he, and he will give all of you into our hands. Right here, in the midst of a conflict, what do we see? We see David saying, eh, this isn't about me. And I want you to write this down. You've already written down worship in conflict. Underneath it, I want you to write the word humility. I don't know that you can have worship without echoing out in humility. And either humility will come out of your worship, or worship will lead into, or humility will lead into your worship. Because it's so key here. But I want to ask you something. When you're in conflict, you're probably not in conflict with a giant. You're probably not in conflict with an enemy that you're actually trying to kill and cut off their head. You're probably in conflict with someone that has a different belief than you. It may come from a different political party than you. Or maybe someone in your home. When you're in conflict, where is God in your conflict? You see, what I like to do is I like to keep God somewhere else when I'm in the middle of a conflict. Because it really messes with what I'm trying to accomplish in it. Because in some ways, what I am trying to do is cut off someone's head in the middle of it. And I don't mean, I mean that more metaphorically. I mean, obviously, we're not talking about murder. I'm talking about that moment where when you're in a conflict, they have said something to you. You're saying something to them, and you want them to feel it, and they want you to feel it. What would it look like if Jesus was in the middle of that, and we perceive Jesus in the middle of that? Because I'd like, you know, like, hey, God, can you wait in the car? <laughs> Let me deal with this. Let me say this to you. That if you're choosing, notice here, he's saying the glory belongs to God. If you're choosing the glory for yourself, it will squeeze out worship. Because humility is the essence of this. If you want to have worship in the conflict, humility will be the main foundation for that. It can't be about you. The other thing that I notice in here that I just really want you to, to be thinking about, if, what would it look like if at the end of all of our conflicts, God was more known? Stop and think about what that means for what you're about to post on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Is what you're about to say going to glorify God, lift God up, or is it going to slam that other perspective? Where is worship in conflict? Let me tell you something, and I'm... And I'm kind of processing this as I'm, as I'm thinking this and as I'm looking at this and I'm realizing this, I don't think this is where worship begins for David. He had been preparing his heart along the way as a worshiper of God. And then when conflict came, it revealed what might have already been there. I kind of think this is the way it works. There's some prep work that happens in your heart before the event that leads you into deeper worship. And then the event itself also leads you into deeper worship. So the first thing that I want you to see in the life of David is even in the midst of the greatest battle he fought, worship was happening. And humility was there. Let's go back to that picture of submission. The idea that I am below you and beneath you, so I will bend my knee, is to say I am underneath. I would say, and I, 
I hadn't really thought this through until we were walking through this. How important it is to see the foundation of humility of whether or not you will have a deep time of worship. The second story I want to tell you about is really something that comes out of the problems that come because David was successful against Goliath. By the hand of God, the giant fell. He cuts off his head and they win. Well, he didn't go in looking for glory. He was pointed towards the Lord, but he received a lot of glory. In fact, there was a song written about him. It was that Saul had killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And there was a little comparison that began. And the king, King Saul, David's father-in-law, began to become jealous. And in the end, he puts a bounty out and tries to take out his son-in-law. And we actually find in, in the chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, David ends up isolated by himself off in a cave. Now he has already been anointed the next king. He has been the, one of the great warriors in Israel's history already. And yet, he's alone in a cave. And I want you to see this, that worship can be had in conflict, but worship can also be had in crisis. And I think this is so critical to see. He had lost his home. He had lost his safety. He had lost his position. He had lost everything. In fact, while he's in that cave, his family also loses everything that they have because they have to come to be safe with him. Jesse, his father, and all of his brothers have to leave Bethlehem where they're from, and they have to come to the same cave and say, yeah, we got to be with you. And there's ends up where there's a whole ragtag group of 400 different people that come to be a part of being around David. Ends up, beauty of it is he ends up not alone. But this is a crisis. And I want to talk about what does it look like to worship in the midst of crisis. But I need to bring some clarity. This is really, really critical. There is a difference between crisis and trial. A lot of us are going through trials right now. And there is a difference between trials and crisis. Trials may help prep you for when crisis really comes, but you need to distinguish between the two because having a bad day may be a trial. Having something break in your car and making you late for work may be a trial. Even this, I would say losing your job may be a trial. Your son is diagnosed with cancer. That's a crisis. And let, me, let, me, let me distinguish the two. It's so critical here. Worship and our response to God has to come in both. But the depth that comes and the, the amount of trust that will be necessary, the amount of humility and the amount of submission is greater in a crisis. And you need to know this, that when it comes, you'll have no other option but to trust in him. Or any other option you will try, it will be you being God. And I might say this, that crisis might be the most beautiful place for worship but it sure is tempting to go the other direction, isn't it? You see, when I go into a time of crisis, I think it's tempting to, number one, say, this isn't fair. It's true, it isn't fair. There are some people that are not getting it as badly as you. The other thing to do is it's easy to blame. Well, whose fault is it? And you know what? Even if it is no one's fault, you can always find someone to blame. And I was thinking about that idea that it's not fair. You know what else isn't fair? Jesus dying on a cross for us. That ain't fair either. By the goodness of God, he allows that to happen so that we can have a relationship with him. So as I look at this crisis and I see David in a cave, one of the cool things about David is that David chooses to write songs. He often writes songs. There's a book in the, in the Bible called Psalms. It starts with a P though, Psalms. And they're essentially songs written about events in David's life. Not all of them, but many of them are written by David. And they're linked to times in his life where he was in either great distress or he was seeing God move. And one specific one, Psalm 57, is actually tied to this specific story. And I want to read you part of it. The thing I love about uh, David is he is so incredibly honest when he's writing these songs. Um, if you ever look at Psalm 22, you might write that down. He's so brutally honest with God. He's sharing with him how angry he is. But here in 57, look what it says. Now remember, the circumstances are this. He's in a cave. He's being hunted by the king who also happens to be his father-in-law. He has lost all position and rank. He is isolated except for the people that have come out to join him. And this is his response. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. This is the beauty of it. He says, I know my only hope. 
In verse 4, he actually described what's going on. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and, and, and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. I don't have a lot of hope here, but I want you to see the end of this beautiful, beautiful psalm. This is what he does. He says to, about God, be exalted. He says, I will sing. I will praise. Be exalted. I don't know how it is for you, but when I hear a song, I, if, if it's a song where I enjoy the, the tune, that helps me a little bit. If it's a song that has some lyrics that really touch where I am, it connects with me. But you know what really touches me? It's not necessarily the words of it, but when I know the story connected to it. And when I read Psalm 57 on its own, I go, oh, interesting. When I know that he's isolated in a cave and he's saying, what am I going to do? It means so much more to hear him say, have mercy on me, oh God. The lions are after me. The beasts are after me. Men are coming here. And what do I do? And his response, be exalted. I will sing of your praise. You know, I think you need to know, no worship song ever ends happily ever after. That's called a Disney film. The reality of life, it doesn't end happily ever after. But in the midst of not happily ever after, be exalted. And I will sing. I wanted to share a story with you that bears this out, that, that shows what happens when crisis comes and what man's response can be when humility says, I will worship you, even when everything's falling apart around me. This is Horatio. Horatio was a very wealthy man. He lived in Chicago. He invested all of his money in real estate, which was a, a great idea. Um, had a lot of money come out of it, but things began to go bad for him. One of the things that happened is his son, uh, Goethe, ended up uh, with typhoid fever and died. I don't know if you've ever thought, stopped to think about the difference between a trial and a crisis. Now this is a crisis because he's lost his son. Following closely after that, the Chicago fire in the late 19th century took out all of his holdings and there was no insurance. He lost everything. And so he was going to spend some time in Chicago and try and help see if he could salvage any of the finances after the fire. His wife, Anna, was sent with their four daughters across to England to wait for them. And halfway across, his four little girls and his wife were shipwrecked in the middle of the Atlantic. And he lost all four of his daughters. It's not a trial. That's a crisis. And the way that Horatio found out is he received this telegram from his wife that said, saved, alone, what shall I do? Horatio got on the next boat and headed to England to go be with his wife. He had lost his son, he had lost his money, and he had lost his four beautiful little girls. What do you do in a moment like that? And how do you respond? What's, what's my worship response in that? Because I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to blame God. It's a lot easier to be angry at God. But instead, Horatio wrote these words. And it says this, When peace like a river attends my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that was taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. And he took that and folded it into a piece of paper. And when the ship that he was traveling on to England crossed the place where his four daughters had lost their life, he took those words and as a memorial dropped them there. Those are the words that since that time to now the church has been singing. And I was just thinking how profoundly different those words mean when I know that they were written about four little girls. When they were when there was the thought of a son that he'd never see again, and the loss of all of his holdings when he's alone with his wife, when peace like a river attends my way, and when sorrows like sea billows roll, it is well with my soul. Even when it's not well with my circumstances, when it's not well with my finances, when it's not really well with maybe even my relationships, it is well with my soul, because even in the midst of this crisis, I have Jesus. And if I have nothing else, I have everything I need. But I want to ask you this simple question. The odds are pretty good that none of you are songwriters and that you know how to turn a phrase and you know how to write something in a lyrical form and then put music to it. 
But I want to ask you a simple question. Like David living in a cave, or like Horatio living out his life, what are the songs that are being written in your life? They may, they may not end up in the Bible someday, and they may not ever be sung at church. But are there markers in your life where you are saying, I see that God held me in the midst of it. And even if you don't feel him holding you, maybe that's the story that you're writing. Maybe that's the song that you're writing. David wrote a few of those. As I said earlier, Psalm 22, it's brutal. He's hurt and he's mad and he's mad at God and he just lays it out honest. But I ask that simple question. What is it that God is doing in your life that is bringing you to that form of worship? And in the process of it, are you able to see it and move towards him and trust him more deeply? The depth of worship that you're looking for sometimes can only be found through the trials and crises that come. So we see that King David worshipped when he was in conflict against Goliath. And we see that he worships even in crisis. There's another place that I want you to see King David worship in. He worships in confession. I would love it if there were, well, maybe I love it more this way, that there are, there are no characters in the Bible that are without flaw except for Jesus. And David is without exception on that. David uh, makes some very, very, very poor choices. One of which is uh, one spring when he was supposed to go off to war. Instead, he sends his general Joab and stays behind. And while he's staying behind, he sees a beautiful woman, a neighbor. Her name is Bathsheba. Bathsheba is married to one of David's inner circle, Uriah. He's one of David's 30 mighty men. This is a close relational friend, Uriah. But David sees her and wants her and takes her. And in the process, Bathsheba gets pregnant. She lets David know, uh, you have a problem. We have a problem. I am pregnant. And her husband, Uriah, is off where David's supposed to be. He's off at the battlefield. And so David tries to bring him home so that he can be with his wife and try and cover up. But Uriah is unwilling to because he is so committed to David. He says, who am I to go home and be with my wife when all of the men are off at war? And so instead he lays in submission at the, uh, at the gate. So Uriah goes back to the battlefield and David says, well, we have to do another plan. And he sends word to Joab, hey, you got to take out Uriah. And so he puts Uriah right where the battle is the worst. And sure enough, Uriah is killed. And David's fine now because the problem is solved. Because what he did is covered up and no one will ever know because the only two people that know are David and Bathsheba. There's just one problem. God knows and God cares. And so God sends someone to David to tell him the truth. Sometimes the very thing that will bring us to worship in the midst of confession is because someone was willing to tell us the truth. And so Nathan goes to him and says, tells him a story. He says, hey, there was a, a rich man who stole from a poor man so that he didn't have to feed a neighbor that came in. What should be done? And David was so angry. That rich man needs to pay the price for this. And, David, and Nathan said to David, it's you. David said, what are you talking about? Nathan says to him, God has said, haven't I given you enough? Why did you have to kill Uriah and take his wife? Have I not blessed you enough? So what do you do in this moment? In essence, you're standing there and your sin is put before you. Interestingly enough, David's predecessor had someone come to him and say, hey, here's your sin. And King Saul made three choices. He made excuses. He defended himself, he blamed, and then he ran. I want you to see David's response. It's here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Do you remember what we said was the essence of worship in conflict? What was it that David did? What did he bring to that battlefield? He brought humility. What did David bring to this story? Humility. He said, you're right. I did it. And I was wrong. And out of this horrific place, 
David wrote one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 51. And he talks about where he is in relationship to God, and he's crying out to God saying, hey, don't cast me from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Keep me close. Create in me a clean heart. Don't make this the end of us. Don't, don't pull your Holy Spirit from me. Please have mercy on me. There's a different kind of mercy that you're crying for when you have failed and sin is on your head. There's a different mercy that's needed there than in, in chapter 57 when he's saying, have mercy on me. These people are trying to kill me. This is a different kind of mercy because this is the, the is, issue of sin. And David did it. And then look at what some of what he says. I, I find this so powerful in verses 16 and 17. He's saying to God, you do not desire sacrifice or I would bring one. And you do not want offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. And you will not reject a broken and repentant heart. You know what I notice here? He's saying, having the amazing church service isn't going to restore me. Having an, an incredible worship service with great music isn't going to restore me. Doing a ritual that brings a sacrifice doesn't restore what God, he's saying a truth that's so powerful. He says, what God really wants is the humility that comes when we say, yeah, I was wrong. I did it. It was me. You see, I don't know that rituals can do anything to restore relationship, but repentance can. Let me say that again. All the rituals in the world can't restore relationship, but repentance can. As we think about this, I want you to evaluate when you're confronted with what's wrong. What do you do next? Do you blame? Do you run? Do you make an excuse? Or do you say, I did it, and I was wrong? I'm going to release to each of the campuses and to the online campus and give you a chance to evaluate a little of this and maybe have a little conversation that may help.